the low light. Stop. Flow a little harder. We're gonna puff one more time, Brandon. Hot torch is my friend. This is cheating, this thing. When I was your age, we had to blow on it. Quick little flash. Here comes my hunting. World class hunting. Oh, missed. Thinking about it. Don't think, Jasper. Ooh. Ready? So again, just uh, short little heats to keep the whole piece from breaking or falling off of the punty, but really concentrating the heat up on that lip up there so that we can resolve the shape. But if it's moving, it can't break. That's kind of the advantage. So. Slowly flare that out. That one's probably the nicest one this morning. One more heat, just to kind of set that up. Just touching that lip to suck some heat out of it. This is kind of the point we want to be at, where there's still some motion in the whole piece. We know it can't break when it's like that. So I'll hand this one off to Chris, he'll garage it. I really like working hot glass. I really like just blowing glass as a kind of meditative process. It's a, it's a very active kind of thrill sport, but it's, you have to be very kind of calm in the moment of it. The beginning of the process is to gather some glass from the furnace on the end of the pipe. The tip of the pipe has to be hot to the point where it's glowing a little bit, otherwise the glass doesn't really stick to it. So you heat up the tip of the pipe, stick the pipe into the glass, make some rotations to get an even coat, kind of come up and keep turning so you have this little ball and let that strip off, take the ball out. If you turn evenly and let it slide off, it'll make kind of an egg shape. And what you're looking for is something that's as long as it is wide from the end of the pipe so that you can blow a sphere into that. I think so, but that would be a visual trick to kind of bring it forward. Or, you know, maybe pineapple. And then we dip it back into the furnace and try and coat the first gather evenly with the next gather. And then you, continue, you do the same thing. You come out, you try and keep it evenly on there, you shape it around it. You blow it up a little bit more. What you do with that gather, that last gather, the, the heat of that, and maybe the, the first heat from there. Like, I don't want to get cold and then heat it up again. I take that gather, get as much work as I can done with the heat of that gather, and while it's still moving, but I'm not able to really finish or move smoothly into the next transition that needs to happen, I'll heat it. So I'm really just trying to soak this in here real hot. We'll push it really hard right there. OK, blow, please. Stop. And so one more heat. I'm going to neck this in again on the Marver and finish it over here. Ah. Yeah. Open. The, that next heat, I can usually get the neckline in. The neckline is a, a restriction right off the end of the pipe where you're going to break the blowpipe away. You need to set that up early 
If it's too big around, it doesn't want to break cleanly through it. It wants to break somewhere into the piece. If it's really small, it only has to break around a little circle. So instead of a 10 inch crack, it's like you know a three inch crack. It's more likely to crack there. Once the neckline's in, we can blow up the what will be the base on this piece. Once that's established, then it's all about getting that tendril set up. So what I'll end up doing is I'll have a big ball here, the pipe, and then a, a narrow spot, and then kind of a fat sausage that's solid. I'll reheat the piece enough to keep the neckline and the blown part from blowing up. I have to maintain that all the way through. But I don't need it to move anymore. So I'll heat it maybe five, 10 seconds, and I'll come halfway out of the glory hole. It's this giant reheating chamber. And concentrate the heat on that part towards the end. So we've got the bubble set up. I'm driving heat into that thick kind of, it's more like a cucumber than a sausage, I guess. And I'm trying to keep it even and this part hot enough that this is going to stretch out to like this, but it'll only be maybe this big around and going to a taper. Um, and when it's really long like that, it's hard to control. It wants to bend. And since I need this piece to bend and wrap in a natural curling way, um, I need to make that move kind of in one move. So I maintain, if it starts out this big and it's all one temperature, if I can pull it out to this, and from here to here is the same temperature, it's gonna, it's gonna draw uh, consistently. It's like, as I'm trying to draw, I'm literally kind of drawing a line in a three-dimensional space around the amphora. Once you stretch it out, if you don't have it right, you it's, you're done. So we're already, you know, three-fourths of the way through the piece, and that move, and then the vessel being presented and me wrapping, actually drawing my line quality around that vase. I'm always trying to kind of grab the body, get around the body, and then half, kind of half loop the lip, because then there's this thin kind of colored lip with this massive wrap that's coming on it. And I like that contrast, that moment between this thin, controlled, delicate thing and this big, beefy piece of glass ripping around it and then, and then not coming off like, you know, where it comes off. It makes sense, like a vine had wrapped around it. A vine wouldn't just suddenly turn right there or it wouldn't have a kink in it right there. It would be a smooth transition. That move, going from this to this to this, is, is one move, if you could say that. Um, that, that is the, the whole piece, is that moment. That's that, from the moment I get to about here, where I've actually stretched it to the length I want, to the wrap, to cleaning up the end and taking the one heat for it, is like a three or four second move. And so, the success of the piece is really in that little window right there. If I, if I wrap it on there and I kind of make a mess of it and it looks more like a knot, there's nothing I can do about it. It is what it is in that moment. And if, if you think about it too much, you're gonna get in the way of your own instincts, your own um, subconscious, you know, the, the zone as they talk about in sport. You're gonna get it in the way of what naturally needs to happen at that moment. It's, it's really the crescendo of the whole thing. So once we clean up the little tip where I cut it, the little tip where it was attached, the M4 was attached to the um, punty, um, it's a matter of cooling the piece down so it stops moving, but not breaking the M4. The big solid part stays hot much longer um, than the thin M4. So if I stay out of the glory hole long enough for the solid part to be stopped moving, the M4 and the thin tip will explode, they'll, they'll cool so much faster, they'll explode, even though the rest of it's still moving. So there's a series of short heats that are just enough to make it move, but not really move, and then coming back and making sure it maintains its center that we've chosen. Um, each time we do this heating and cooling, the core of that thick part gets cooler and cooler 
and cooler. And we want to get the center of the solid part to be the same temperature as the thinnest part of the M4, so they're all the same temperature. You ready this time, Brandon? So once they're one temperature, then we heat it up to the point where it just moves. We're into the softening point of it. What do you say? It's born ready. Born ready. Born in the USA. And then we pour water on that neckline that we created earlier, and that makes it cold instantly. And what we're trying to do is get it to crack along that line, the neckline that we made by getting just that little zone, that little quarter inch, all the way around below 800 degrees where it wants to break. And everything else being up by the softening point where it cannot break, it physically can. At that moment where we think it's stressed correctly, we tap on the pipe and the vibration is like, it's like sets off an earthquake within that, that cold spot and it, it will crack off. We take it over to the annealer, it's a big electric oven. You know, front loaders in this case. When the oven's full, we let it soak so it's all one temperature, and then over time, we let it come down to room temperature. Once we bring them out the next day, it's kind of, it's always like, it's a little bit like Christmas, like, who did they make it? The, definitely the fun moment in there is when you have this long squiggly thing this long and it's like bring that now and take this noodle and you got you got one shot at it. I mean you can't erase or back up and how am I going to wrap this so in just like a three second gesture with your hand you're creating the, the whole gesture of the piece in that one moment. And again, that's the thing for glassblowers that, for me particularly in the activity of doing it, those, you know, you get this moment right, or, oh, we put that one over there and we start again. And I like that challenge to, you know, have everything going right in one moment. So I'm always trying to set up in glass those moments. And that's particularly the liquid moments, like when we're ladling the glass or when we're making these squiggles and constructing them, I don't draw them out and then try and make this exact drawing of what I'm going to make. I draw them out so I think about shape a little bit or proportion a little bit. Um, and then I just kind of go in a direction with an approach to the material. And I let, I let happy accidents happen. I intentionally allow for things to go wrong to see what if and see if I learn something from a mistake or a moment with the material, like right there, I was trying to do this and I did it wrong, but did you see what happened? That was cool. Let, let's let do more of that. Let, can we do that again, but do it a little more this way, a little bit that way. So again, as I said earlier about, you know, I've been blowing glass over 20 years and I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, halfway there at best because there's so many of those little moments that we have to experience f to learn from the material, to utilize in the work of the next piece so that we can take that moment that's that you know that beautiful moment and and repeat it repeat it to let the material you know speak well on its own as an artist i don't have a boss saying you know make more of those good job you got it done today the approval of that of doing something that's productive that people enjoy, I'm, I'm a part of something that's moving forward, is people either buying art from me or, or coming up and, you know, and telling me, hey, I like what you're doing, you know, keep doing it. It's, it's good for me and it's, I think it's good for them. Thank <laughs> you.